Hi there. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is Dr. Karen Trainer, and I run Innovative Vet Path based in the Kansas City metro area. And I read diagnostic cases, dirt path cases for, for vets and dermatologists all around the Kansas City area and all across the country. And I'm going to share with you uh, an interesting case today. Um, so I'm going to share uh, my uh, screen with you in just a moment. Um, I'm going to present to you a case uh, of a dog from sunny California. So um, you'll get to see that. Um, and we'll, we'll go through uh, some of the clinical presentation and then we'll go through the histoscientific after that. Um, so this is uh, from the ventral abdomen. This is a dog named Xena. She is a 14 year old female spade pit bull mix and she's from Southern California. Uh, as you can see, she's got a, a light color hair coat and on the ventral abdomen, there's this area here of, of alopecia and then uh, an enlarged nodule that's red and, and there's a lot of erythema in the skin here. We can see some small crusts and flakes in the skin. Uh, this is another view of one of these enlarged nodules that's very erythemic, dark red, almost a little bit black in some areas. Um, we see more of the, the crusting on the surface of the skin and then just this very mottled look uh, a lot of erythema and sparsely haired skin. So this is more caudal on the inguinal area and we can see, see the peeling that's starting to happen, some uh, uh, keratin that's lifting off the surface. And then we see, if we look closely up in this inguinal fold here, we see that the skin, oh, here's the cat that's joining us today. Uh, we see that the skin has a somewhat crepey appearance. It's, it's uh, finely crinkled like crepe paper. Uh, and then we see more of these, these crusts on the surface of the skin here as well. And this is another view, oh, another view of um, the inguinal area and we can see starting to spread onto the medial aspect of the, of the thigh and, and um, we just see how erythemic this is, the crusting again, and then the how sparsely haired this area is. That's normal anyway for this region, but even more so than usual. Um, so she's got some, some chronic issues going on for quite some time. Uh, they biopsied before and uh, we're repeating the biopsy, uh, looking for a definitive diagnosis. So I'll switch over to the histo path slides and we'll go through that. Bear with me one moment. All right, I wanna make sure you can see everything. All right, so we have got uh, multiple skin punch biopsies and I'll, I'll show you there's, this is a, what artifact looks like when you grab a punch biopsy with forceps. Um, these, if you can imagine, are the edges of the forceps that are grabbing the tissue. So it, it gives it a good squeeze in the center. Um, so that's uh, something that we see sometimes uh, with punch biopsies, because when you collect the tissue, it's very fresh, um, it's very soft and delicate. Um, so before it's in formalin where it firms up, um, it's, it's very susceptible and prone to um, crush artifacts from forceps. So uh, just something that we see uh, ordinarily in pathology, not something you would see probably in like a textbook or splashed around anywhere because it's something that we, we normally look to avoid, but you can see a little bit of it here as well, just where the forceps touch the tissue. Um, it's the tissue is just that sensitive. So uh, setting that aside, uh, what we've got here is just cruising around, we can see that there's quite a lot going on. So we've got a, 
uh, loss of adnexal structures. We do have some adnexal structures, so some hair follicles, some glands, but there are these large areas here of fibrosis, and then we see lots of blue. Um, so there's probably something uh, going on there. We'll take a look at that. But I just wanted to point out while we're still at low power, how extensive the fibrosis is. Because when we were looking at those clinical pictures, we remembered seeing how it was uh, very sparsely haired. And in some sections, we have no adnexal structures at all. So while the inguinal area certainly is less densely haired, um, and there are fewer and smaller sebaceous glands in that area. This is, is beyond uh, what we would expect for that region. So uh, we've taken a look at that. And then let's, of course, uh, examine what's going on with all of this uh, inflammation here. So if we take a closer look, we see that it's a lot of neutrophilic inflammation. We've also got macrophages mixed in here as well. We also have a collection of lymphocytes and plasma cells as we take a closer look. And we can even start finding MOT cells, uh, which gives us an indication of how chronic the inflammation is. And these MOT cells, if you'll remember, are cranking out lots of globulin. And that's usually a sign of chronic antigenic stimulation. And so when we're breaking down inflammation into different types of patterns and crafting your morphologic diagnosis, you can have Remember, peracute, subacute, acute, uh, or peracute, acute, subacute, chronic, um, the different, uh, you know, chronicity. Um, and so, certainly, when we see plasma cells and, in particular, MOC cells, that often points us towards something that's very chronic. Um, and that fits with what we were just looking at at low power with all of the fibrosis. So, that ties in together. Plus, combined with the clinical history that this has been going on for a while, it's been biopsied before. Um, so we have all of that. But when we look at this inflammation, what is the cause of it? We didn't see any infectious agents, but when we look in this uh, section, we see there's a very large structure here. So if we take a closer look at that, and then this hair follicle is dilated as well. There's a lot of excess keratin. Remember, we were seeing all that keratin flaking on the surface of the skin. It's also uh, extending down into the follicular infundibulum and into the deeper into the follicles as well. So this is creating comedones, and, and they're dilated and they're filled with all of this excess orthokeratotic keratin. And then we also have uh, hiding out in here within the lumen of this distended hair follicle, uh, lots of cocci. So we have all of these uh, coxoid bacteria uh, lurking within the keratin. Um, so that's contributing to the inflammation as well uh, with all of this uh, milieu going on and all of these plasma cells. Um, so, and all the pyogrine along with this inflammation. So we do have uh, some small spacious glands. We have these distended hair follicles. The ones that are left are very extended and they're creating, um, we've got parunculosis, we've got comedone formation. Uh, so that's the, the main driver of the inflammation is the rupture of the comedones, the release of the free keratin and the bacteria that might be in there into the dermis. It incites a very robust antigenic uh, response. It um, stirs up a lot of inflammation. And, and really drives this process. But what is causing formation of the comedones? And why are those developing? So certainly we would expect, um, we you know, think about uh, Cushing's disease with comedones on the ventral abdomen and the inguinal area, but there's something that's special about this one, which is different from what we would expect to see with a case of Cushing's. Notice how thick the epithelium, the follicular epithelium is in this section. It's not very thin. With Cushing's disease, you get a thin walled comedone. And here we have a thick walled one. So that tells us probably not endocrine related, but we have some very strong clues when we come back up to the epidermis and the superficial dermis about what the driving factor is in this case. And so the first thing we can see uh, when we're looking at the epidermis is that it looks a bit thickened. 
Uh, we do have this uh, nice open basket weave pattern to the keratin. This is all orthoperitotic keratin. It's beautiful, uh, but it might be perhaps a bit thick. Uh, but we do see that the epidermis itself is thickened. And then, so we have some acanthosis. And then if we look at the dermal epidermal junction, it's not a nice, uh, smooth, straight line. Uh, it's got an undulating pattern to it, and it's kind of wavy and, and going up and down. So it's, it's uh, irregular. And then we also get formation of this, uh, almost like a peninsula, extending down into the dermis. And these are called reedy pegs, and they're extending down. So they're finger-like projections from the epidermis that are driving down into the dermis. And then if we take a look in this superficial dermis, it, it's got all these blue squiggly lines, to use the technical term. And this is solar elastosis. And this is a sign of UV damage, solar damage. So that's what's driving all of these changes. It's a solar damage. Um, and that's what's causing this very irregular um, uh, pattern, sometimes I think it's referred to as festooning uh, of, of the dermal epidermal junction. And then we have some excess ptosis of inflammatory cells. We have a patch here of parakeratosis. This is different from that orthokeratotic keratin with the open basket weave appearance over here on the right, as compared to the patch of parakeratosis we see on the left. Um, so that's something to, to note as well and also a number of dilated vessels. They have a slightly smudged appearance. Some of them are lined by slightly hypertrophied endothelial cells. So I would not be surprised if there is some degree of solar vasculopathy here as well. Um, we'll ignore that up the slide. Um, so we've got some mixed inflammation, plasmacytic inflammation in the superficial dermis and then uh, all of this fibrosis and solar damage. So rare for sunscreen. Um, that is the, the take home message for this case. Um, so definitely preventing further solar damage would be the way to go. Um, treating the bacterial infection. Um, it's a, a multi-layered process, but um, that's really the secondary part. The primary is the solar damage. Um, with loss of all those that pencil structures, the scarring, you can see how um, uh, pale some of the collagen is here. And then with those prominent blue squiggled guts, that's the telltale sign. Now, solar elastosis can crop up with other conditions as well. Saw this quite a bit in paint horses in Texas with squamous cell carcinoma, but you can see it in paint horses from anywhere with squamous cell carcinoma. Um, they're prone to that. Um, and, and certainly other diseases as well, but uh, this is an important one to remember. So that's what was causing the red nodular lesion. We're not seeing any solar hemangiomas or hemangiosarcomas here. Uh, the, the, there's quite a bit of hemorrhage associated with some of the frontulosis in some of these areas. Um, if we take a closer look, um, we can see that there is hemorrhage associated with this as well. So that's what's causing the red appearance. There is a mitotic figure. You can see mitotic figures with mixed inflammation, uh, but there's a lot of different inflammatory cells here. And um, so just something to pay attention to. Um, we did uh, examine all the sections and, and no evidence of neoplasia, but that would be something else to have on the radar. Um, so I just wanted to share this case with you. I hope you found it interesting and I would love to hear any thoughts or comments you may have or if this is something that you see uh, where you're at as well. Um, this dog, like I mentioned, is from Southern California and that seems to be where most of the cases I've seen of this are, are from, um, from the Southwest of the United States. But I know it can happen anywhere. I'm sure there's lots of this in, in Australia and other, other sunny places in the world. Um, so I hope you enjoyed rounds today.